Hello, my dear students, and welcome back to our first lecture with this electronic three module. As I demonstrated, maybe in the zero lecture, we will start our module with the first chapter under the title of Out Stage and Power Amplifiers. So let me now start our first lecture. Yes, I think you can now see my uh, presentation slide somehow. We have a pointer and we can start. Okay, so as I mentioned, our beginning chapter is outstage and power amplifiers. So this chapter, uh, you can find this chapter or this section typically from SEDRA, uh, Microelectronic Circuits in chapter 12. As I mentioned earlier, my dear students, this, was, uh, this chapter number may differ whenever you are using a different version. However, you will find it somehow under the same title of out of stage and power amplifier. So let's start doing it. Okay, so maybe in your electronic two classes, you have already demonstrated what's called a multi-stage amplifier. A multi-stage amplifier is simply a cascaded series of amplifiers are connected together in order to make some sort of, a, of an targeted amplification ratio with a typical linearity and a typical frequency response. For example, if we consider, for example, a, for example, 100 times amplification power amplifier, an amplifier with an uh, uh, with a uh, with an amplification ratio of uh, 100 or 1000 or whatever, most likely this amplification ratio will not be obtained using one stage. So you have to have a cascading stage, for example, each was 10 times or each was 20 times, and then the overall amplification occurs whenever you reach the uh, series or the targeted number of cascaded uh, uh, left. But now we are not considering the amplica amplification process because we assume that you already have some knowledge about this amplification process, either in electronics one or electronics two modules. But now we are considering the connecting point, the terminating point in the amplifier when you are going directly to connect into Zagot. In this direction, let me remind you, let me remind you with a very uh, important uh, topic. We already have some knowledge about it, which is operational amplifier. I think you already have an operational amplifier class during your electronics one. If you remember, my dear students, in electronics one, when you consider uh, operational amplifier, maybe in the second or the third slide of this lecture, by the way, you can refer to the lecture. It's still uh, available over YouTube. So in this in this case, we have demonstrated operational amplifiers in this manner. Okay. We have here uh, an in in inverting input, a non-inverting input, and here we have the output. In this case, we define the term what's called an ideal operational amplifier. And we said that an ideal operational amplifier is an operational amplifier with an open loop gain equals to infinity and input resistance equal to, uh, to infinity and an output resistance equal to zero. Here is the output resistance. And here is your load. So, what is the impact of such an output resistance? Let's assume that you have here what's called the V output. This is your, your typical output from the amplifier after doing this amplification stage. Then, what is exactly reaches the load at this point, which is V auto dash. This is your load. And this is your R output. 
as you can see from this demonstration, uh, based on the fact that v r put dash equals to r load over r load plus r output times v output. So as you can see, when our output the, our output is equal to zero, which is again represent the ideal case for an operational amplifier in our uh, conventional electronic one classes. This ends up with V output dash equal to the V output, which is of course your target. So all the uh, generated voltage typically reaches the load without any losses. However, let's assume for example, a dramatic scenario, when we say that Let's say that our output equal to our load. In this case, V output dash will turn to be 50% of the out of the output. So you lose in the output resistance 50% of your power, when you of your energy. So this is the very basic effect or, or what we can call the loading effect of the output resistance. That's why. Whenever we have a standard operational amplifier, if you remember from our classes, let me now return back to the presentation slides. I think you already remember. That's you. So if you remember in our operational amplifier uh, problems, we used to calculate what's called the input resistance, which is the resistance seen by the input. Usually it is uh, something and yeah, let me use an R. So this is, it's, it is somehow in this direction, if you remember, this is the, the input resistance. And also we calculate what, what's called the output resistance, which is the resistance seen by the output. This was a standard question or a standard part of the question in any operational amplifier in any, sorry, a MOSFET or BGT amplifier uh, problem. And by just re uh, refreshing your answers in the sheet or in the exams or whatever, you will find that our output was not equal to zero. It has some sort of value. So generally speaking, in our standard electronic amplifiers based on the MOSFETs or BGT, mostly MOSFETs, we use or we have an finite value for the output resistance which is not equal to zero and as you just see in our wide board this finite resistance may influence or it will influence the output reaching to the load due to what's called the loading effect so it's not only the process of amplifying the voltage or the current with a certain ratio, it is also the process of generating this voltage and current with a minimum output resistance. That's why we need this output stage of an amplifier. So one of the main functions of this output stage amplifier is to have a minimum output resistance so that it can um, minimize the loading effect. However, it is also have some additional features or uh, functions, such as minimizing, minimizing the total harmonic dist uh, distribution. We will consider this later on. And one of all the very important points here is related to the minimum power losses in this stage. Because typically, whenever you add something here, we, we can say between quotations that we are adding a buffer before, because this, this circuit will not add any sort of amplification. It will not amplify the voltage. It will just the input equal to the output, but with minimum output resistance. So whenever we add this, um, uh, whenever we add this stage, this stage will consume some power because this is a, an active circuit. So we have to have this power as minimum as possible so that we did not make a loss in the overall operation of the amplifier. This is mainly that 
aspects or the targets whenever we are implementing a out of stage power amplifier. I think you can understand now we call why we call it out of stage because it's um, the, the, the last, it's a terminating stage. It's uh, the final stage before the road. That's why we call it an out of stage. By, but why we call it a power amplifier, not just an amplifier? We call it a, a power amplifier. This is simply because in these two stages, the first and second, and maybe the third stages, or what all stages before the out of stage, what you are doing is you are amplifying the circuit. So you are scaling up from what we call a small signal input into the to, to the to the to the MOSFET uh, with many volts, for example, or something like that. Then you are now amplifying this to a high voltage version of the circuit. So most likely, what will be inputted to this out of stage is a high voltage, relatively most high voltage signal. That's why we usually call these amplifiers as a high power or a power amplifiers because they are not as in the previous version or in the previous stages where you have a small signal as an input. This has a very important reflection on the way where we are going to study this amplifiers. Because first of all, it is not technically 100% correct to call them amplifiers because herein we are not amplifying the circuit, but or we are not amplifying the signal, I'm sorry. But we call them amplifiers because they are part of a big amplifier. That's why we call them an output stage and power amplifiers because they are part of, or they, they are a step toward making an amplifier. But on the other hand, let me return to the first point, which that they are different from other stages because in the other stages, you have an input signal, which is what we call a small signal, and you amplify this into a higher voltage version. Herein, you are not going to amplify. You have already a high power version. What you are going is just, you are interfacing a low output resistance to the load. Accordingly, if you remember in your electronics one and electronics two classes, usually when we have an, a MOSFET amplifier, and we are going to do this analysis for a MOSFET amplifier, we usually use what we call a small signal model to the amplifier, if you remember this current dependent voltage source and with input resistance and output resistance, so we all use that. And this is typically associated to the concept that the input signal you are using is a small signal. And if you return back to our electronics one classes, you will find that this small signal condition was very important mathematically when, when you ignore the second order curve. However, now, in this case, we, we don't have a low signal or a low voltage signal anymore. Our signal is now a high voltage. That's why during this course, maybe 99% of the cases, we are not going to use or we are not going to solve our problems based on small circuit models because simply we don't have a small signal. We have a high voltage signal. This is very important to distinguish between what you did in uh, Trunks 1 and XH2 and why you use a small signal model and what you are going to do in this module and why we are not going to use a small signal model. Okay. So typically when we are considering power amplifiers or outstage power amplifiers, we consider many classes or categories. The first, what we call a class A power amplifier. The second is class B, the third is class AB, and the fourth is class C. As you can see, of course, we are going to go deeply to understand each and every class of these classes in a very detailed manner. But generally speaking, the main difference between these four classes is related to 
the duration of operation. What I mean by duration of operation? Usually we have what's called a sinusoidal input voltage, as you can see, including both a positive half cycle and negative half cycle. So if your amplifier is going to work across the whole 360 degree of that signal during the whole operation, during the whole period, then we will call this a class A amplifier. If it's going to work only during the positive half cycle and will turn off during the negative half cycle, then we will call this a class B equation amplifier. If it's going to work in the, in a, in the positive half cycle and it can still work in a portion of the negative half cycle, but not over the negative half cycle, then we will call this a class AB. And if it's only work during a portion, not all the part of half cycle, we will call this a class C. I can understand that it's not 100% clear by some stage what is the difference and why we are intending to make amplifier not working all the time. This will be the questions to be answered during this chapter. So this is just a global definition or classification for different amplifiers, but I believe that, or let me say, I will. I hope that by the, the end of this chapter, you can somehow distinguish and understand the meaning beyond each of these uh, classes of an power stage amplifier. So let's now turn to the first part of this lecture related to what's called a class A uh, out of stage power amplifier. No, okay. Before going into the, 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 the depths of this structure and before illustrating ideas about it, let's just do a very quick refreshing memory on the bipolar junction, which is the main building block in this schematic. And actually, maybe another question should come to your mind here as usually in our Electronics and electronics one and electronics two, I mean, uh, classes, we use uh, MOSFETs in the implementation of our amplifiers. And if you remember my uh, solid state classes, maybe two years ago or more, we have uh, already discussed the advantages of the MOSFET over the BGT. And I told you that I consume more time in uh, giving lectures about MOSFET because this is the main bowling point in, in industry and all this stuff. However, now what you see in this circuit is a BGT, not a MOSFET. And here, this is come with one of the main selling point of the BGT compared to the MOSFET nowadays. So, Whenever we are considering a low voltage application, analog low voltage application, typically we are going to use MOSFETs. Of course, and it goes without saying that MOSFET is the main bowling unit in all digital applications. However, the, the room for power electronics and the high power voltage application is still reser reserved for the BGT. So this is one of the main reasons why BGT is still surviving. It is it is still preferable or recommended whenever we are considering a power application like the case here. That's why we are using BGT. However, generally speaking, you can build a similar circuit using a MOSFET. And maybe if we have some time by the end of this chapter, we are considering some similar circuits for our power amplifier, out of stage amplifier, uh, uh, power uh, amplifier as an out of stage using MOSFET, not using BGT. So this is possible to be mentioned. Now let's back to the basics for a power stage, oh, sorry, the basics for a bipolar junction transistor or a BGT. 
Okay, so if you remember my new students, BGT or bipolar junction transistors are of two types, either an NBM or a PNB. So if we are considering the NBM, here this is a collector, the base, and this is a metal. And this is N P N. The regions of operation for a bipolar junction transistor depends upon the voltage given between the base and the emitter. So, first of all, we have to search for the voltage. By the way, here electrons are emitted by the emitter moving through the bipolar junction transistor till it reach the collector. That's why electron is moving from the matter to the collector. And as you know, the definition of current is the reverse of the direction of the electrons. That's why the current is moving from the collector to the matter. And that's why we have this arrow indicating the current motion. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, what about this VPE? If this VPE is greater than 0.7, or it's still smaller than 0.7. So if it's smaller than 0.7, that means that your transistor is in the off state. It's not working. So the collector and the emitter are not connected together. If it's greater than 0.7, then you have two possible regional operation. The first is what's called the active mode, and the second is what's called the saturation. The active mode is occurs whenever the VCE is greater than VCE plus. So the VCE here, if this VCE is greater than VCE sat or the VCE for saturation, you, you for saturation, usually it's around 0.2. So if this VCE is greater than 0.2, then the, 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 the transistor is working in the act mode. If it's smaller than 0.2, then the, the transistor is working in the saturation mode. If we are going to reflect this into an IV curve. So this is VCE, and this is uh, the IC, and you will find a curve like that. This is what's called the saturation region. Whenever the VCE is very small, again, this is around 0.2, and normally this is the active region, whenever the VCE, VCE is large, and this is IC for a given, of course, IP. And of course, to have this curve, you should have a VPE equals to 0.7. So that your transistor is turned on. Otherwise, your transistor will, will be turned off. So this is, um, in a very quick manner, how we can uh, understand very basically the, the region of operation for a bipolar junction transistor. So, let's now go to our circuit. And here, this is our circuit. Okay, so we will call this Q1, this Q2, and this Q3, this is R, this is negative VCC, and this is VCC. Uh, here is the input, 
and here is that. Okay. So this is basically the circuit we are going to deal with. Of course, I have to apologize in each slide about my very bad handwriting, but uh, I think you, but by some slides you will use to, to see or to understand my writing. But this is basically the circuit how we can plot. We have two, uh, two B and B bipolar junction transistors, one in the uh, one in the uh, 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 connected between the input and the output in, in, in the upper uh, or in the upper part of the, uh, of the circuit and the, another one here and we have this schematic. So in order to understand this, I will first start by dividing this circuit into two portions. This is the first portion where we have this Q1 with input and output and VCC. And the one in the in the bottom side, this will be the second portion. So let's start with understanding each portion individually for this circuit. So Let's start with the first portion. This is a VCC, a source. Here we have a collector. Here we have the emitter, and here we have the base. The input is connected to the base, and the output is for the emitter. Okay, so this is simply the circuit. Now, Back to our uh, understanding to a bipolar junction transistor. A bipolar junction transistor or a PGT starts to work when the voltage on the base is greater than the voltage on the emitter by a value of 0.7. So in order to make this transistor on, you should have 0.7 voltage here. If the voltage here is 0.7, then your transistor will, will, will start to work. So, here we can say that we should have VPE equal 0.7 to make this transistor to make this transistor work. Okay. This VPE should be equal to 0.7 to make this transistor work. Then the base is now connected to the input and the emitter is connected to the output. So I can write V input, which is the base voltage, minus V output, which is the collector, which is the emitter voltage, should be equals to 0.7. In other words, I can write V output equal V input minus 0.7. V output minus equal V input minus 0.7. This configuration, my dear students, is usually named as a metal forward. Why we call this an emitter forward? Simply because a matter is following the base. Whenever the voltage in the base increase, the voltage of the emitter will directly increase. Whenever the voltage of the base decrease, the voltage of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, base uh, of oh, sorry, where, where the voltage of the base whenever the base decrease, the voltage of the emitter will decrease as well. So it is following the the emitter is following the base. The higher the base, the higher the emitter, the lower the base, the lower the emitter. That's why we call this an emitter forward. So this is the first part of this circuit that the output is following the input with this 0.7 value. And please take care of that. Herein, there is no amplification ratio. The output equal the input minus constant. So the output is not an amplified version of the input. It's just the input with a, a, a DC shift of 4.7. That's all. And this is, we already have mentioned earlier, 
that the target of this circuit is not to amplify the output signal, it's just show out low output resistance to the load. So this is the first part of the circuit. Let's go to the next or the second part of the circuit. Okay, so we have here, we have This is negative VCC, and here is the up. Um, this is connected to the dot, and then again negative VCC. And here we have a resistance pulled off, and we have a ground, and this is Q2. Of course, this is the collector of Q2, this is the base, and this is the emitter. So this is the, the circuit configuration for our circuit. Now, now, what will happen if here you have your emitter is connected to negative VCC? That's true. So in order to have this transistor on, the voltage here will be negative VCC, I think you will not use that in the right here, okay, it will be negative VCC plus 0.7, or plus DP. Is this right? The voltage here should be a negative VCC plus 0.7, so that the voltage in the base is greater than the voltage L in the emitter, or the, the voltage in the base is greater than the voltage in the emitter by about 0.7. Whenever this, then this transistor is on. Okay. So, my question is, if this transistor, K2, is working in the active region, if this transistor is working in the active region, that's mean that, let's remember the IQ, IV curve. This is the IV curve. What is the definition of an active region here? That you have some VCE, which is greater than VCE sat. By the way, your VCE here is V output minus VCC. So whenever, oh, actually it would be V output plus VCC because V output minus minus VCC, so it is V output plus VCC. So whenever the voltage here is greater than the VCE sat, that means that you are in this region. Okay. What is the main characteristic of this region? As you can see here that the main characteristics of this region is it has a constant current. As you can see, in this region, the current, which is this isovalency current, is constant. That's why we usually call, or we usually say that this device is behave like what we call, my dear students, as a current source. Because now you have a fixed VPE. This is a DC branch, which is totally independent of the input. As you can see, this circuit has is not changed by the input. I mean, the operating, the operating VPE is not function in the input. And for VCE, of course, uh, the VCE, the function of the, of the V output, but as long as this device is in the active region, whatever the VCE is, you are still you are still contributing with the same current. So in this case or in this direction, you can say that this is something as a current source that generates a current equal to the IC or the saturation current, the collector current in the saturation region. And this is a constant value. So by the end of the day, you can say that our circuit under investigation consists of two regions. Let me open a pointer. So I'm searching for a pointer. Okay, this point is the first. 
Okay, so this upper part of the circuit is called an emitter follower, as I mentioned, because this point, which is the emitter, is directly following the base. But knowing that the V input is connected into the base, the V output is connected into the emitter. So as you can see that the V output is equals to the V input minus the VPE1, which I said typically equal 0.7. So this is how the emitter is following the base, as you can see. The second is that this bottom circuit is simply a current source as far as this transistor K2 is working in the active region. So whenever this transistor is working in the, in the active region, we now maintain that the voltage here is an V negative VCC plus VPE2. So current is flowing in this direction. And then we have this circuit schematic representing the voltage here and representing the operation. So the current is a constant, and this is some sort of a current source. So this is the first inspection on how this circuit is operating. Uh, the first part is an emitter follower. The second part is a uh, current source. And of course, we have here the loop. Now let's go deeply on how this circuit will behave as an output stage power amplifier. So let's now return back to our whiteboard. And let's plot the circuit again. Okay, so this is our circuit, as you can see. We have Q1 and Q2. This is the input, this is the output, and this is the load, of course. And this is, oh, okay. So we have, in this circuit, we have some fixed points. Like, for example, this is negative VCC, and this will maintain negative VCC plus VPE2. So the voltage here is greater than this voltage, so this dial will turn it on and will, the current will move from here or generally current is moving from the ground to the negative voltage. Here there is a branching point. Some current will go to the base of the of the key two and some current will go down in this direction. Okay, so, so this will kept the same during the whole operation of a circuit. But what about the other points? So let's assume that now this is a positive V input. Let's assume that our input is in the positive half sign. Okay. If our input is in positive half cycle, then V input is positive, then let's assume that V output is positive as well. Now, this, this difference is over 0.7. So as we just mentioned, the output equals V input minus V E. One, the output equal the input minus VPE one, which is the open set. So the voltage here is lower than the voltage here by open set. Now, what happened if what happened if this input increase? Then this output will also increase accordingly. But the effect that now. As this voltage increase with the constant VCC on the collector, that means that the voltage across the VCE, the voltage across the VCE for VCE1 is decreasing. Why it's decreasing? Because this is constant and this is going up. So the difference here is decreasing. What is the minimum value needed to make this Transistor Q1 is still in the on or the in the active region. If you remember, my dear students, this is what's called VCE SAT. So, generally speaking, generally speaking, if 
Generally speaking, we can say that VCE1 equals to the voltage on the collector, which is VCC, minus the voltage on the emitter, which is V output, minus over 0 0.7, then it would be plus 0 0.7. Which is V T E one that is not. Okay. Let's let me write it again. Okay, so V C E one equals VCC, which is the voltage on the collector, the collector minus V output plus VPE1. Okay, VCC is constant, V out, VPE1 is constant. Now we are is assuming an increasing input. So we need whenever sorry, this is input, not output. I'm sorry, this is input, this is V input, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So it's VCC minus V input plus VPE1 because all this term is the V out. I'm sorry for it. So whenever the input increase, that means typically that VC, VCE1 will decrease. Whenever the input increase, VCE1 will decrease. So what will happen then is what is the minimum value with VCE1? The minimum value for VCE1 is VCE size. In this case, VCE1 size will be equal to VCC minus V input minus V or V out. That's right. Then this represent what dear students. This represent the maximum value of, of V output. So whenever V output increase, this increase. So the maximum value of the output corresponding to the minimum value of V C is out. So V output max equals to V C E C minus V C E one side. This is the maximum output you can get from a stage from this stage. If this out uh, if if this voltage is greater than that, your output will be clipped by this value, which is VCC minus VCE1 sat. Back to the slides. And again, let's open the pointer. And this is the maximum value here. So what happened if this voltage is increasing, this voltage is constant, the minimum value here for this VCE is VCE sat. So the maximum value here is VCC minus VCE sat, as you can see. Okay, so if this affecting this transistor, so if, if the input is positive and the output is positive, is this will affect this transistor? Typically, no. Why? As far as this is a positive voltage, which is the output in positive, and this is a negative VCC, so the VCE2 now, VCE2, will be equal to the output minus minus VCC, VCC. So it's V output plus VCC, which means that it's an increasing VCE process. So as you as the output increase, this value, which is VCE2, is going to increase. So if this value is going to increase, that means that you are far from saturation. So whenever the voltage is positive, you, you don't need to check this current source. This current source is work very fine. What you need to check is this transistor to avoid that this transistor is going to the saturation region by this condition. 
Okay, what if the input voltage is negative? If the input is negative, using this equation, my dear students, that means basically that the output would be negative as well. The output equal V input minus VPE1. So when this value is negative, that means that this value is negative as well. So what happens if this value is negative? Now let's see. VCC is positive. Negative, negative V output. Then VCE1 now become totally positive increasing. VCC minus minus V output, which is VCC plus V output, which means that this transistor is going more and more in the active region. We don't need to worry about it. However, what about VCE2? VCE2 now equals to negative V output, negative, negative VCC. So it's negative V output plus VCC. Now, Going more negative here may affect this Q2 so that VCE2 reach VCE2 sat. Let's see this in the white paper. So now our Q2, or basically our input is negative, which means that the output also is negative. So please open the circuit in your uh, PowerPoint and let's write an equation for VCE2. So VCE2 equals to what? Equals to negative V output, which is the voltage in the collector of two, negative negative, which turns to be positive, VCC. And now the input is going more toward negative. So the output is going more toward negative, which means that this value is going to decrease because VCC is, cause, is, is, pos, is constant and ne negative V output is increasing in negative. So that means that output is decreasing. What is the minimum value here? VCE2 sat. This represents what? This represents the most negative value for V output. So this is negative V output minimum plus VCC. In other words, you can say that V output minimum equals to what? Equals to negative VCC plus VCE sat 2. This is the minimum value for the output signal that can be reached. In this case, whenever V output reaches negative VCC plus VC, uh, uh, negative VCC plus VCE sat or plus VCE sat 2, in this case, what will happen is your Q2 transistor will turn it on saturation region. So this is the bottom level of your signal. So as you can see, we have the bottom level of our signal and we have the upper level for our signal. The bottom level is related to the Q2 to avoid to reach saturation for Q2 when the output minimum equal to negative VCC plus VCE sat. And the upper level is related to the output maximum to be equal to VCC minus VCE one sat. But let's remember that we consider this, this structure, this one as a current source. And for any current source, we have what's called the maximum capability of the current source. Or in other words, for any transistor, there is a current at which represents the maximum value. So let's now assume that we are in the negative portion of the curve. I mean that the V input is negative, and of course, the V output is negative as well. 
how should it look like the current schematics in this case? Let's see. Okay, so for the first Q1, we should have current usage direction. Because as you know, the collector is positive and the emitter is negative. So current is flowing from the positive to the negative. And knowing that this VPE1 is greater than 0.7, then your transistor is on. Now, there is a very important point. Please take care about it. This point is grounded. And this point now is negative. So the direction of the current flowing in the load here should be something like that. Current is flowing from the positive direction, from the ground, to the negative point in the voltage. That's right. So here the current is flowing downward. Here the current is flowing outside, out, out, out going from the load. So by making a KVL at or KCL at this point, that means typically the current here also will go downward again because this point is more negative than this point. So current will go again from the collector to the emitter, which is typically the current flow in a bipolar junction transistor. So the current flowing here, is an R again. So the current flowing here is in this direction. So you have two branches of current. The first is coming from Q1. The second is coming from the load. And these two currents are now terminating on the uh, are now terminating on the transistor Q2. So if you remember, now we are going toward a negative output voltage. You remember that. What is the maximum output voltage? The maximum output voltage here, the output equals to the current flowing in the resistance times by the resistance, basically speaking, V equals I times R. So the maximum output, we call it here minimum because this is in the negative region. So it is a minimum value. So the maximum negative or the V output minimum represents that negative I times R L. That's true, negative I times R L. So now what if what if the capability of this transistor is limited to a current which is not equivalent to this voltage? I mean, the maximum condition occur when you when you equalize these two equations together. This is V output minimum, which is negative I times R L. And this is V output minimum, which is negative VCC plus VCE sat two. So typically speaking, the current passing in this transistor should be equals to negative VCC plus VCE sat over RL by simply equalizing these two equations together. However, let's say that this equation results, for example, with a current of four milliampere. So you have to have a current of four milliampere in order to make this equalization. But practically speaking, practically speaking, the current that can survive in this transistor is only three milliampere. That means that your output voltage will be clipped with the minimum value, which is three, not four. This you can see here. So in the in the bottom in the in the top boundary you have one top boundary which is VCC minus VCE sat one, but in the bottom boundary you have two bottom boundary where the smallest one is applied. The first is I times RL. The second is negative VCC plus VCE sat two. Fortunately, if two conditions are occurred. So the current here, the maximum current flowing in the transistor here is equal to this value. But if it's equal to a smaller value than this, then your, your output voltage 
will be clipped by this value. So this is typically the process of how the transistor works or how the current works. This is a very, very important point related to the concept of a power amplifier. So we have one top boundary and we have two uh, 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 bottom boundaries. You, of course, as a, as a designer, should ch uh, choose a transistor that is capable of having this maximum current at least. That's why we have this greater than or equal. So you can guarantee that the minimum boundary occurs at this point. And here you increase what we call, my dear students, the maximum swing, because simply the maximum swing is related to the bottom boundary and the top boundary. So the higher the, the bottom and the top boundary, the higher the swing you have in your output signal. This is how we can conclude the first circuit with the class A power amplifier. Uh, during the lecture, we are going to solve on campus together this example. I would believe that this is a very, very important example because it will give us uh, more toward the understanding or the focus of the, uh, the, the process of these uh, uh, transistors and how uh, this uh, power amplifier works. We will go also into some uh, details related to this R value because we still didn't go deeply about this R and the impact of this R. By solving this example, you will know that uh, this R is a very fundamental uh, parameter in our case or in our design as a design parameter. Then we, in the next part of the video, uh, actually this part, which is related to the problem solving will not be uh, recorded because this will happen on class on campus, but in the next part, we will go to the power management in this uh, power amplifier circuit. And also we will talk about the uh, output resistance because this is the main uh, objective of having this uh, outstage power amplifier. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you in next lecture or in the next part of this lecture. Thank you very much.